It's a pleasure to be here at the Cooper Union, and I really like to thank the Architectural Lead and Billy and others for inviting me here. It's always a pleasure to come to New York. I have lots of colleagues and friends and students. Uh, it's great to see some of the former students out there, and that's the great thing as you get older, you just have more young friends out in the world if you teach. Uh, tonight I'd like to talk about our work at Hood Design Studio. As Michael said, we've been involved in sort of making public work over the last 20 years, and during that time I've had the opportunity to get to know a lot of people in different places, but also I've had the opportunity to be very critical of the work in landscape architecture and environmental design and allow for this sort of conversation not only with the profession but with the community to transform the work. And therefore tonight I'd like to talk about this idea of the conscious and the unconscious hybrid. And it comes out, this basic idea arises um, out of sort of ecological history and this notion that in our landscape today, everything is hybridized. There's nothing that is a pure return to origins. And as we deal with things like climate change and um, the changes in particular places, I think this is a different way for us to sort of understand the places around us, that they're not original, that we've changed them so much, in fact, that those processes that the science sometimes tells us, uh, gives us a direction, is no longer true. And we don't really have a name for this sort of conjunctive beauty that we have of these places. Uh, this picture I'm showing you here is the salt ponds in San Francisco Bay. And every time I fly home, I look out the window and I see this landscape and I'm always overhearing people saying, wow, isn't the bay beautiful? The colors. And you know, they think it's natural. And for a lot of people, whether it's a pond, whether it's a creek, whether it's uh, an ocean or an edge, you know, they think, in many cases, it's a return to origin. And for landscape architects, this can be sometimes very problematic because you're pushed then to sort of romanticize a way of living that actually can't be uh, contained. This idea, once, if we're fixed on this idea of the hybrid then, how can we talk about this hybridity? And how can we participate with it? And so there's two terms, this notion of the conscious hybrid, very early in our work, we question this notion of the double consciousness. And what I mean by that is a lot of landscapes have a cultural prefix attached to it, that people living in a place, uh, San Jose, California, George Hargraves made a plaza back in 1988, it's called Plaza Park. And I was working for the redevelopment agents, I was like, Plaza Park, wow. And people in the city called it Plaza Park. And you go there, and of course, it was a historic plaza. But of course, it had growies everywhere. It had plants everywhere, a very small, hard surface. So through that hybridity, you have this collision right, of culture and time and of formal uh, decisions. But it's always this kind of, you're trying to fuse something that, that can't be actually fused together. And in many places, people ask for the park. Right? The plaza came because the Spaniards were there, but people wanted it to be softer, and they wanted that wilderness to come in, and so hence we have this hybrid. And so in the early work, whether it was Cortland Creek Park, Lafayette Square Park, Macon, Georgia, Splash Pad Park, these hyphenated, double conscious spaces, you know, began to look very strange to me, that they had these weird juxtapositions, and we never tried to iron out that juxtaposition, whether it was a space under a freeway um, that people called a park, that also had a splash pad, that also had a cantilevered freeway, that also had a parking lot. But this space now was one of the main sort of centers to a community. And people are able then to construct their own sort of story about these spaces. And as we started doing work and as work got larger, we started to question then the notion of the typology, the notion of the type. This is Golden Gate Park. And again, this park is built upon an old sand dune. And again, it's not an, or an original. But people go here and they think that this is what that landscape used to look like. And as we worked on the museum here with Herzog and Demeron, we actually tried to play with that notion that you, know, that you had these um, fictions that people were 
sort of associ had associated themselves with historically and sort of contemporarily. And so we really got into the notion of the garden here and how the garden sat in the park and how we could talk about the fictions. And just really quick, the idea for this museum very early was that it would have a public front and it would have a private back. And there's just a tripartite scheme that allows the landscape to come through. Now the fiction in this building is, is base isolated, which means it's in a hole, it's in a moat and the moat has a 15-foot trench around it. And so we created this fiction by bringing the landscape up and actually making planters around the entire edge. Then we went around for a quarter mile and we took all the plants that grow in this park and we brought it into the museum. Because the plants were given to the city from Japan, from Australia, from these different places in the late 19th century. And so when you go to the museum then, you're met with this fiction. And this fiction sometimes, is ameliorated with the building, it blends together. This is from the um, um, restaurant terrace looking back out, but the landscape from the Japanese tea garden or from the larger eucalyptus grove is actually reflected back into the building. When you look across at Herzog's building, the building is flat, it creates this new horizon, and the, the gardens are actually able then to come in and meld within the building. And again, it's a fiction. We had to bring in dirt here, all the dirt here is was originally sand. You had to put in a lot of amendments to get things to grow. We were also able to save the 27 palm trees along the front. Um, the museum uh, invested, this was a gift again from the late 19th century from Australia and from South America. We were able to save them and bring them back and they float over a parking garage. But as people use this space, this has now become one of the main public spaces in the park. I think last year the, they went over the million mark as far as attendance. People in San Francisco sort of look to this garden almost as a return to origins and not as a fiction that people have actually come to think that this is a real landscape and this is what everything else looks like. And in certain places, we allow the dalliance of, you know, that, or, that origin, that original landscape, which were sand dunes through grasses. But in most cases, we try to sort of get people to look down at the ground and actually think about where they are. So as you're moving through the space, you're constantly looking down at the stone, at the detail, and at the various materials. And for us, that was the interest in the sand, because if you look at the Pacific West, sand is every color that came from the East. And if you look really close, it has this beautiful coloration. Artists such as Andy Goldsworthy was part of making these gardens. This is Drawn Line, uh, where Andy cracked the stone in the Appleton Greenmore. Inside the, um, the tree ferns from Australia, we bring them inside the museum and take them all the way into the basement, where the water courses through along with them. And then as they break outside, they become this other sculptural effect. There are places for kids to play. Um, there are benches for people to sleep on. There are all kinds of uh, activities that take people into this fiction and try to sort of teach them that this is all artifice, right? And so as you're moving through the landscape, you actually see that a lot of these things were not of the original. And then at times we actually push some things that occur naturally, like the fog. Every, I think every hour on the hour, the fog comes out and mists the entire garden. And like clockwork, children just reappear from nowhere. And to the other side of the building, we use the Japanese tea garden actually as a foil to bring that landscape through. And you see the three gems by James Terrell, which is on the far end, which also serves as a sort of an intermediate sort of horizon piece to take away that landscape from JFK. And no museum can be a museum without the obligatory piece of sculpture. And then its setting, again, colliding with the older garden out to the back, which is the Japanese tea garden. This project for us was sort of at the end of this notion of, you know, again, thinking about a single type of landscape and trying to sort of understand its relationship with another landscape. Because at the end of the day, the garden is something that we all sort of can imagine in a lot of different ways, these early typologies. And I would ask the question, everybody in this room has a different idea what a garden can be, but the main thing, it has that relationship to the natural environment. 
and through the planting, through the materials, sort of people come to sort of understand the place in which they live. And again, for us, this double negative had very little to do with San Francisco. Everything in the garden has ideas actually in the world, less in the sort of site-specific way. So if the first decade of our practice was about the conscious, the thing that really gave us a little bit more uh, ammunition to sort of work in a varied um, sort of way around the country and world was this notion of, can we stop thinking about the typology? You know, and I made a project um, or gave a presentation in DC about five years ago and I said, well, the 21st century, maybe we shouldn't have parks and people almost fainted. But this notion of if we continue to call something by its name, a park, what does a park mean today? And being here in New York, I love going to Central Park. You know, you go to Central Park. And back then, people were arguing that parks had to be over 1,000 acres, right? Because of course, the park was the antidote to the built. And so you had to immerse yourself in it. Today, a park can be the size of a parking space, right? That, that we can all agree that a park can be that small. There's parking day every year. Every city does it. We take over parking space and we make it there. So the park really doesn't have any power anymore, I would argue. Right? And a lot of the types, we've sort of run out of there. They, they're useless to us. And so can we stop talking about types and really start to imagine the objects, spaces, the historical foundations of how places are built and really start to talk about people's relationships to things in places. And for us, that's been a fruitful sort of investigation in the second half or two thirds of this presentation is really about really trying to think about fusing and disrupting and being really deliberate about how you're doing things based on the places in which you're making things. This first project is in Oakland, California, and we were hired to do a streetscape where you plant trees 10 feet on center, you know, you put in tree guards and you put in benches. And it's located next to a BART aerial freeway. And this part of Oakland is completely blown out. Everything is the scale of the freeway or the Bay Bridge. And so what we decided to do was pump up everything. And we decided to sample all of the light poles, all of the signage pieces that holds up the freeway signs and actually start to sort of use those objects and talk about this place. And so no longer holding freeway signs, it holds six African-American heroes from Barack Obama to Martin Luther King to Malcolm X to a lady who owned a jazz club on the street. But it's sort of, again, through that scale of the object that's so familiar to a place, all of a sudden it's remade in a completely different way, giving people a different understanding of that context. So when you're on the Bay Bridge looking up, you see the giant seven foot truss that's holding the Bay Bridge lights. You go home and you have that same structure, but in turn, it has Barack Obama, or it has another figure in which people in this community, during our community meetings, would come every meeting and say, I want my five M's. I was like, what's the five M's? Malcolm, and they would mention them every time. And I'm like, I don't wanna make five M's. And then again, looking at the context, it became very clear that the five M's existed in that ordinary landscape. And then even for the bus stops uh, and the signage, everything again is like three times its size, which in turn has given this place something that the architecture couldn't give it. They tried to build public housing and other things, but it was diminutive. It didn't add up to anything. And so now there is a new gate a new place to arrive at in West Oakland. This next project is down in Florida. It's called Oasis Oasis, and it's located in a place called Opalaca, Florida. And Opalaca, Florida is a very interesting place if you've never been there. Someone had a great idea in 1920s that you know, Hollywood was into the Middle East and into Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, and someone said, let's make a retirement home with Moorish architecture. And so they built a city that has the highest percentage of Moorish architecture. And we were hired to come in to do a public art project. And the client said, what, what project do you want, Walter? And I was like, what's Alibaba Way? And they said, Alibaba Way is a two and a half mile street that connects the triangle, which is one of the most troubled areas to the downtown. I said, I want that. 
So we said we want to take the street, the two and a half mile road, and make it into a piece of sculpture. Now to give you a little bit, a, a, to understand Opalaka, this is what the council people fight for, right? And they're very serious about it. And this is the first place I went to. It's like, you cannot wear baggy pants. You can't have your pants riding down your ass in this place. But that's the politic here. It's a lot of black leaders who really care. But if I go back to this image, this two and a half mile way has no public amenities for people. All the public amenities are for cars or trucks. It has uh, a bollard. It has a bench. It had vacant lots. And one of the highest, uh, how can I say, highest yet issues, one of the largest issues here is stormwater. And the elementary school kids, K through five, one of the biggest uh, reasons why they have absentees are the streets get flooded because they have these very quick flash floods and everything gets silted in. So we came up with this project that has 15 oases that stretch over two and a half miles. And at each oasis, we try to give people some shade, uh, some texture, a respite, a stop along the way. And we took this constructivist idea of can we take curb and gutter and sidewalk and actually start to reshape it and form it so that these simple things that the city already pays for become something completely new. And then can we embellish them, right, with a kind of hydrological sensibility so that through this sort of the storm surges, when it rains, it actually gets better versus more miserable. And we're doing this primarily through simple techniques of flow through planters and then taking, again, the sidewalk and bunching it up through precast um, sort of pieces, making benches, making places where the water can sort of flow through, and then taking over the main road so that then when there's an event, imagine if you live in the triangle, you have 15 oases to sort of stop at. So we presented this public art project to the NEA and to our client, and it turned out that the city was about to spend millions of dollars on their stormwater because they got this huge grant. And so we asked them for the plan. Their plan was to do a giant pipe that was like 80 inches plus under the road where no one would benefit. And the CDC that we're working for, being as great as they are, said stop. And the guy called me, Willie. Willie was the youngest African-American mayor in the country. I think Willie was a mayor when he was 21 years old. Amazing guy. And he called me up one day and said, Walter, give me some talking points. I'm like, what do you mean? I need to talk to these engineers. Give me some talking points. I said, well, just mention BMP. He goes, what's BMP? I said, best management practices. He goes, OK, <laughs> click. The next day I get it, he goes, can you come to Florida? We want you to be the project manager for our stormwater project. Because we've had best management practices in the state for 20 years, and no one wants to do them in our neighborhood. And so now he's armed with right, this sort of the technique. And we've been able to go work with the schools, uh, flooding properties, and being able to create these oases in the public realm for a marginal group of people but also for a city that's trying to sort of reclaim itself back through the use of art. And so here's where art and engineering really comes together. I wouldn't typify it more as landscape architecture because again, it's not streetscape per se, but it's trying to sort of take the performance that happens through the natural environment and actually make something manifest that's larger, right, than a single bioswale, that's larger than a single flow through planter and engaging with places. This is the barbecue hut at the end. And there's misters and places to sit while you're eating your ribs. And so you have this like amazing wet experience. <coughs> this next project is further down in Los Angeles. And we just actually was completed a week ago. And this is a public art project that took six years and these projects these small projects take a long time to manifest and a lot of it has to do with you know working in the art arena is completely different than working in the a e arena because a lot of the money is coming through public and it gets vetted meaning you have to have community meetings and people come in and go i don't like that can you make it green or i don't like stone can you make it metal but we decided to sort of talk about something larger there's a 20 plus acre buffer park here that I'm not going to show. And it was a buffer park to basically ameliorate the port being next to a community. 
So they designed this park, it's got all the bells and whistles, to take away the port. And people have lived by this port for most of the 20th century. It's where the term greasers comes from, right? I mean, people worked at the port, came home. So it was always a working class place. And so we wanted to sort of bring back or talk about you know, something that was always and that's always there, and that's the sandstone. How LA used to meet the ocean that's been completely taken away. So we built eight towers that march across the landscape that are stacked, that when you stand in one place on both ends, they actually read like the old coastline, right? And they're very, very simple. They're just stacked stone and they cantilever back to one side. But as we started building the project, it became really an interesting set of relationships because unbeknownst, you know, probably not unbeknownst to me, I wanted to build a tower the first time I came out here, but when you start seeing it now because it's a land of towers. Everywhere you turn, there are all these industrial towers. And so now we have our new landscape that wraps along this hill, sort of talks right to the industrial landscape off in the distance. But when you come up closer to them, they're human scale, and they actually provide a context that benches and red lights and other kinds of things you find in these landscapes don't give you. And there's this kind of relationship that you can then begin to sort of have with you know, this kind of material. And so it's less about, again, being rhetorical or trying to say that this used to look this way, but giving people real material. Right? And it's something that, again, has become something less and less that we find in the landscape that the material has become so artificial and has become so prolific in its singularity. I think the way this project was described by ASLA was through the red lights and the benches. Right? I mean, they talked about it and, and they have names, but that's how it was known. This next project is in my hometown, Oakland. Um, it's a rooftop garden that overlooks the city. And a lot of our projects, we started working now on a lot of residential rooftops in the city uh, where people are really interested in um, dealing with a lot of the hydrological issues, but also dealing with the new horizon. Uh, we have about five of these projects going right now. But here, we're working for a nonprofit um, that really wanted the space that was porous, but they were fixated with the circle. The circle, as you saw, is their symbol, right? This unifying diversity, and that's all they would talk about in the meeting. Can we get circles, circles, circles? So we decided to give them a lot of circles. Um, and this roof deck is really quite wonderful because a lot of the wood we're able to reclaim from down south, uh, this beautiful red wood, the entire ground becomes this kind of porous surface that the garden then can burst up through and you can sit out and have your receptions and you can have a relationship with the city that's very different than um, most spaces here. Uh, this next project is a high density housing project. Both of these are with architect Ann Fougeron out of San Francisco. Um, this project is really about, you can't really see it, the underground creek. And in the Bay Area, probably just like Manhattan, there are these buried streams. And floodplains are always floodplains. When it rains, you still have the same issue. We were asked to come and work on this project and say, could we do something with this buried creek? You can sort of see the creek here, the housing project is here, and this creek was opened by the community here, and it only has about that much water in it, and it's faux, but they pump up a small amount of the water and run it through. And the developer was like, what well, can we do something with it? And so what we decided to do was take Frog Park, which is this faux creek, and actually bring it through the building. And if we could bring it through the building, we looked at three different ways of bringing it through the building. One was kind of multi-basinal, where we allowed the water just to come in and find these small locations. Another one was a very classical one, uh, very Alhambrian, where you come in and you have the reels. But the one we sort of liked more was a kind of series of dams, check dams, and a series of spaces that came through and eroded the building. And this was the final plan that came through where Fog Park comes here. It comes up to the building and actually breaks through and actually tries to create this new public way. So this will all be public space coming through the building. The ground floor will be Whole Foods, and these will be small uh, sort of incubator spaces. Scream restoration is, is one of those activist uh, 
things in the Bay Area that brings out hundreds of people if you talk about daylighting a screen. And so in this case, it's actually providing advocacy for high density, right? And so by talking about the screen, then people start to understand people living next to this element. And we're allowed to, since the water is already pumped underneath, we're allowed to bring about one to two CFS out of the ground and it has to return back into the ground. So it's not really doing anything to the larger sort of ground plane, but it's providing an experience for people who live in the neighborhood. And then above, we're taking the roofs and we call these the these parapet strategies where the building has these parapets wrapped around and we're taking the parapets and actually catching all the storm water in the parapets and the parapets are actually then becoming gardens and flowing through. Sometimes the parapets detach themselves and becomes pieces of furniture. And so again, what we're trying to create is this kind of one seamless thing that's not a roof garden per se, but it's talking about how architecture may, might engage the flora, might engage this sort of process. One of our favorite projects at this moment is in Memphis, Tennessee. I had never been to Memphis, um, but it's been one of those places that you kind of imagine. Um, but Memphis was one of seven, or seven or eight major distribution centers for Sears and Roebuck. And they built these huge buildings to basically take all of the catalogs, right? When I grew up, we had the big Sears catalog. You looked through it, right? And if you lived in Memphis, it arrived here, went down some chutes, came out the other end, and it was delivered to you. And a million square feet, right? There's seven of these. A lot of them in most cities, Seattle, Boston, Chicago, have been redone into these mixed-use places. Here in Memphis, it's being developed through the arts. It's the project manager is an art historian at Memphis State, which is a fantastic client to have. You know, the meetings just go on and on and on about Renaissance art uh, until someone asks about the windows, right? But Todd is fantastic in bringing us in very early and saying, Walter, we want, we want you to kind of curate this stuff, man. Can you take, can you just go in there and like curate this stuff? And we're like, cool. So we came in and immediately we started to sort of find all of the stuff and we're working with two off two groups of architects now you can imagine every time you go into a million square foot of ruin everybody goes in and they're like just freaked out and they're happy and they come out and they want to do this and you get back to the office and you just can't like do anything because you've just like blown away by all this detritus in the in the building so we decided to say well what if we asked a different question of the building and say you know through demographics through music and all of these things food arts distribution can we look at landscape, wildlife, climate, vegetation, topography, microclimate, and really bring those two things together so that they could actually be something very, very simple but powerful. And we did this over and over, trying to understand the logic, whether it was bringing the woodlands in because Memphis is a woodland, you know, or thinking about how water might move, or thinking about animals, or thinking about how people might move vertically, or thinking about how the site might get inhabited through this matrix. And then doing enough of it to ask enough questions to sort of find the logic that's, I guess, more internal to the site and more internal to with the people of Memphis. And once all of these sort of have been exhausted, then really stepping back and saying, well, how much of this should we not do, right? Because in a way we want it to hold on, right, to the, the scale of the building. And so we ended up with about seven or eight of these kind of ideas that we were then able to sort of think about individually sometimes, but collectively as a way to begin to sort of bring that large scale million square feet to this 15 acre site, right? And so creating this kind of seamless relationships in and out. And a lot of it had to do with really thinking about the scale of the building and about the field condition that existed outside of it. And what we ended up doing was trying to come up with names for the different places in which you know, we were working, like the canyon or crosstown clearing, and so that people had this other way to associate themselves with the landscape. And so crosstown clearing became this narrowing down the road and making this kind of green respite as you came in, 
or creating these infinity fountains that collect the water that's running under the building and coming back out and not shielding the building because it's a historic building. But really thinking about how all of those spaces gets used, but also bringing the scale down and letting the scale actually be big when it wants to be. Working with Arab engineering, a lot of the devices that we're using to move water through the site, we try to get rid of all of the kind of uh, dumb things like curb and gutters and actually start thinking about porosity and kind of materials as you move through. So even the car moves against a kind of a lumpy edge, you know, where, where the sidewalk hits the building, it becomes really, really green because we found out in the building <laughs> that the flood uh, height is really high at the building and they're pumping. They've always had to pump out all the water from the aquifer under the building. So for like 50 years, they've been pumping out all of this water. So there's this water constantly being pumped. And so now we're trying to think of ways to run it through the site for growing food, for creating new surfaces. And then on the inside, going in the inside and finding some of these elements on the inside that we can take to the outside. And our last trip, we were down and we were walking through and the light was perfect. And I noticed that behind each window, there was a radiator and the light raking through the radiator was just really beautiful. And we were coming from a VE meeting where we had about $700,000 worth of railing out. And the client was like, do we need that railing? I was like, yeah, we gotta do something. Can we find a cheaper railing? And then we was like, well, we got radiators. So we started now collecting radiators right, and really thinking about how again, the stuff might start to add up. And at the end of the day, we found we had, how many radiators, Tim? 80? 145, and so 145 radiators go a long way, and of course, Arab was like, oh, we can do great things with radiators, right? And so thinking about how they get attached, but really trying to, again, create a story with, through these materials so that they have another life. And many things in this building, uh, all the steel windows are being replaced. Right, and you just think about all of those windows. It's like, can we have those windows? So we're now trying to, you know, get the glass out of the windows because they're toxic, and maybe even use the windows as a way to begin to talk about making a greenhouse and some of the other elements. But you know, again, thinking about making landscape or thinking about making sites not in the conventional way, not through just making drawings, but also again through having a conversation with people, having a conversation with a place and then making sort of these leather and rubber benches, you know, that might, you know, have different colors that then could, again, find, find a place out in the environment. And then on the inside, we have these large courtyard spaces where we can actually create these more aviary-like spaces where there could possibly be birds and people and things like that through these kind of hanging gardens um, that are made in a lot of different ways. Returning back to San Francisco, this project is in Powell Street, which is located in downtown San Francisco. And this is um, one of the most highly trafficked sort of tourist areas in the city. And what's really wonderful about it, O'Farrell Street, there on the right, if you go one block up, it's the Tenderloin. And this is like one of the most ruckus parts of the city. But here on Powell Street is where all the tourists come. I think on the weekends, I think the um, the district has sort of reported about 30 to 35,000 people use this street. And so you get this incredible mix. We were asked about Audi, the car company, to create, as I mentioned very early, a park, a set of parklets, right? And San Francisco has sort of adopted these parklets where they've, in certain areas, you can get a permit and you can take over the parking space. And we were like, well, we don't wanna do parks because we don't believe in parks, but can we do something different? And so Audi was like, we really want you to riff on us. And was like, what do you mean? Well, we're aluminum, man. We have the only aluminum chassis. We have all these things. And if you build this, we're going to launch our A4 car, and we're going to put it out there and take photos of it. And so we worked with a local steel guy, and we actually then riffed on the Audi chassis, made a jig, and actually made all the furniture. Everything sort of relates to sitting, leaning, uh, touching. Uh, and then we have some PV, and then we take over the eight feet for three blocks. And we were able to take three city blocks 
for a million dollars and fabricate and actually put in place in 60 days. And that's the fastest I've ever built anything in San Francisco. The beautiful thing about this project was the, it took us about six months to keep all the plants because every time we would put the plants in, the Tenderloin people would come in and take the plants. So their apartments got furnished for the first six months and then we, we did fine. This next project is back in Los Angeles. This is the new Broad Museum by Dillard Scofidio in Renfro. It sits next to the Performing Arts Center by Frank Geary. And working with Liz on this project, we decided, you know, the conversation we were trying to have is this building didn't really have a landscape. The street next to it, here, was one space below. Grand Avenue, Upper Grand, sits here is a tunnel. So we had to build pretty much a freeway to put the landscape on. And as we sort of built this new deck, there was then room for a new cafe or restaurant towards the back. And this project has been <laughs> great working with Liz because we both started out saying, we need to do something that's really, really about LA. And right, we came up with this notion of trying to create this fictional landscape. And I think we started out with the the forest of bad behavior or something, you know, and Liz had, you know, these trees that had no arms. We were making, you know, tinsegrity tree structures that had rooting pods. And we were really trying to sort of create a different kind of space. And at the end of the day, the client was, I want something amazing. And so working through the project, once we built the deck, it took us about two years to arrive at something that would be interesting. And it, I think it probably blew both of our mind that we ended up with something really, really simple, but kind of strange in that, like a dozen olive trees, right? But the nice thing about them, they're over 100 years old. And we were able then to take these 100-year-old olive trees and then turn the deck upside down and then fill the deck with dirt and then make a simple lawn and actually give life to something that's been around longer than we have in this fictional landscape. And then along the street, where again, we don't have any dirt underneath, we've created these bulbous planters where the ground kind of shakes and then gives birth to these, these kind of bulbous forms that allow us to then plant trees. And then as you make your way back over to Maki's um, Martin Museum, you now have this new destination this thing that's been there the whole time, that's actually older than Maki's Plaza on the other side, and you have these two bookends of green that you can move back and forth with. And then on the way of getting the, um, the olive trees, we found that they have these old stumps that were really beautiful, and so all the furniture is almost as if some of the trees died, some didn't make it, and you're actually in this really cool forest. And Tim and Zoe searched the world over for these trees all over California, and then we found the ones that we wanted, brought them back and put them in space. And this will be opening up in the spring. Back to the East Coast, Pearl Street in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Pearl Street is an alley. Philadelphia is a city of alleys. I was asked by a nonprofit to come in and make their alley, which is at the top, a park. And we got into this long conversation about why she wanted a park, and she, because it's green. And also because it would ameliorate a lot of the issues that happens in their alley, which was this kind of dank, stinky thing on the left. And I kept saying, well, when I lived in Philly, the alleys were cool, right? That's where you went. And so we had to go through a process then of reintroducing Philadelphians to alley space. And we did this entire anthology of all the alleys, and then we started talking to people along the street. And what was really interesting was in each block, there was one, two, three, four blocks, there were four different constituents along this alley. The first block was high school, homeless, shelter. Second block, arts, hipsters. Third block, developers, non-union. Fourth block, Chinatown. And we went to each one 
And each meeting probably lasted about two hours. And they were mind-blowing. This meeting here, I will tell no lie, the guy, he's, I call him a god, he's the godfather, this guy here. He looked at me, he's like, you have beautiful work, but you don't have a Chinese eye, right? I went to the next block. You know, they're like, well, this is kind of great, but this space will never be anything because the homeless people are always here. We went to the next block, sort of like uh, arts. Oh, let's just make art. And then we went to a 300-bed hostel home for people who are down and out, and I've never experienced that before. If you've never been to a space like that, I think everyone needs to go and see how a lot of people have to live. And the men, totally spiritual, through um, a Catholic program, about a hundred of them sign up for a program and go through like a two-year program to better themselves, get off of, you know, all kinds of things. And they felt persecuted in this landscape, that no one liked them, and they get caused for all the problems. And then at the high school, the high school was like, we don't go to the alley, we don't want our kids working with these people. I get back on the plane going to California, and I'm like, I have no idea what the heck I'm going to do. So I go to Berkeley, I go to the library, and I'm like, didn't Philly was known for making furniture? So I like found the Queen Anne style, some Chippendale stuff. I was like, let's make furniture. And so the client was like, huh? It's like, yeah, let's make some furniture. So we made furniture. And we painted the street, made furniture, hung some lights, and then we had dinner. And the cool thing about after doing this activity this first night, even the men were with us, everyone was there. I mean, the street was awful, there's rats running around, but it was like really wonderful. And everybody started to see the space. And that's when I could then talk about how do we transform it. And so I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly, but we had these various elements, you know, looking at air conditions, taking blowout, using the blowout to make green. Uh, why didn't people use their back doors? It's because it's dark and scary. So we have these programs for artists to work with various um, groups to sort of illuminate these edges, to create mystery and intrigue. And we then sort of put, put it to the various groups to say, look, you guys have to be active agents in the space. If you guys don't activate the space, no one will. And we put it out to them that you need to do this. And through each block, we said, historically, people lived on the block, and now people don't live on the block. And you have these huge blocks where you have two or three institutions, and you guys don't want to come out the back door. And so we started cutting sections through and saying, well, why don't you go out the back door? It's just as nice. This is a housing project that has a door onto the alley, but they've boarded up the window. And so, of course, no one looks there, and so all kinds of things go on there. And so we came up with a project for fresh windows, and artists will work with anyone who wants a fresh window. You can get a, a vitrine, you can get a sitting window, you can get a kneeling window. Uh, we work with the Sunday Breakfast Mission to sort of take them out of this sort of incarcerated space and actually then think about having people relate along the alley. And we have a project here for a roll-up door that will then have a table and you can actually go and eat with the men who are actually staying here and living here. And the food is really, really good. They have a top chef, but you would never know it because you can't see inside. And then with Asian arts, really getting them to sort of curate the alley. Maybe there could be movies and things like that that could take place at different times because they are an arts organization and they have half the block. And just by them doing that, then it's possible for this alley to transform itself where all of these different people together can actually start mixing. And they would mix through the arts, through the space being made over and over and over again. So we were invited back this year for our second installation and second group of work. And no one over the last year, no one opened a window. You know, no one opened a door, it's still dank. And we're walking through LACMA, and I was taken by this George Siegel piece at LACMA. And when I lived in Philly, I remember Siegel had done some pieces in Philly of the people in windows. So we decided, let's make some windows and just take them to Philadelphia and put them in the alleys. And so this past year, we made windows. And people could then sit in the window and actually see what a real window looked like in the alley. And it was so marvelous. People would come in, sit, and take pictures in the window, and there's a window boarded up behind you. And these two little girls who live around the block, 
they were just fascinated with having a window, right? And there was a little girl here, half the day, some, I overheard her, someone came up and said, um, why is this window here? She goes, I don't know. And so I went up to her and I said, do you know why the window's here? She's like, no. I said, well, when you don't have windows, people do bad things. So all day she sat there and told people, if you don't have windows, people do bad things. And then we made a double window where you could actually go in if you didn't want people to see you and you could actually look through a telescope window and people could see you or you could see them. And after this year, now we're actually gonna repave the alley. We're actually going to start the window program and we're actually gonna do a new arts uh, development down at the south end of the site. This next project is in New York. This is at the University of Buffalo up in Amherst. We won a competition about five years ago to do a 1,000, one megawatt array. If you've never been to Buffalo, well, if you've probably been to Buffalo, you haven't been to the University of Buffalo out in the suburbs. This is one of their suburban campuses. And to create the campus, they pretty much tucked the creek, put it in a bypass, scarified all the soil here, and built a suburban campus. And then they used some of the storm water here for effect. We wanted to sort of remake the dirt because a lot of the dirt was bad. This is the bypass, and this is, probably has the highest biodiversity on campus because this is where all the good water goes. But it's diked off from everything else. And so our competition project looked like this. We said, look, we want to bring all of this new patch ecology to the project site, just like you have on the east side, and we want to create better biodiversity through this new thing that would then be a gateway and give you a new element. And this is what the plan looks like. And we also said we want you to stop cutting the grass because that's a 24-hour job for those guys with oil and mowers, just cutting grass, cutting grass, cutting grass, and develop a new mowing regimen. And then that way we can codify what's happening with the solar panels and what's happening through your vegetation. We could begin to sort of understand from the different um, dormitories and the different sites how much power that we're actually using. This project has been up a year and a half now. It's a quarter mile long. They've started the mowing regiment. The guys really like this because they have purpose. They can come and make the straight line, right, and come back and make another line. And the students heard about this. I said, how can we get involved? So we have tree planting days every um, Arbor Day, and the students come out and we have to plant the trees with bare roots because the soils are really bad. Most of the trees that were planted during, like this tree right here, let's get my little thing, the one in the foreground there was probably planted 25, 30 years ago. Most of the trees are no taller than 16 feet, and it's because they were all stunted. But through this program, we've now began to sort of create this new type of landscape, and they were already testing letting the landscape go. So most of the landscape is pretty much doing its own thing. So after about a year, letting this thing sort of breathe, the biologists started to come out with the classes and started to find different species of plants. They found that there were these weird vernal pools that had these tree frogs and all this beautiful vegetation. And then they had hawks and things coming down to eat all this stuff. And then people heard about this, and so now it's a National Wildlife Federation is now certified wildlife habitat. So within two years, this thing has like just completely changed over. And uh, when these people came, I don't know if this is true or fiction, they were walking down the pathway, and the pathway is that we just let everything go, right? And there was this groundhog coming out of the ground, and these women from the Wildlife Federation are there looking, and this hawk comes down and just grabs this groundhog, rips his head off, bloods everywhere, and they're like, wow, right? But it means that this place is like working. It's doing its thing. <laughs> but every piece of material that comes out of the building now, we get asked, do you want bricks? Sure, we'll take it. And it's given this project, again, this kind of strangeness, you know, along with, there's a little warbler down there with some of the projects. But it's a really wonderful sort of sight, you know, to get people to kind of see, again, something that's very different, right? It's not this kind of manicured suburban thing. It's wild. It's kind of scruffy. It's kind of dirty. But people, the students, they come here and they can learn about technology, but they can also learn about the natural environment. And if you go on their website, you can actually see the metrics 
uh, while the project has been in use. And this is one of the things I love that people come to this place and they immediately, the kids, they just touch. You know, and it's one of the few places you can just touch panels and they it's, get this exhilarating sort of effect. And all different causes now from bike share, you know, they use it all the way to PETA. You know, they use this space to talk about those larger environmental concerns. This next space is in Jackson, Wyoming. This is a building by, um, God, Kurt Fentress, actually, uh, out of Denver. It's a wildlife museum, right? And Kurt, I guess, built the, on, on this hill because the client wanted something to look like a Scottish ruin, and it looks like a Scottish ruin. Million people come through this amazing landscape per year, and they don't see the building because it's like a Scottish ruin and it blends in. And so they've done everything to get people to stop here, like putting elk out there. And that elk's not real, guys, okay? There's a big one down by the road, and when they put a big one down by the road, people stop their car, take the picture, get back in and keep going, right? And so they're like, what should we do? And so they put out an RFQ for um, a trail, a sculpture trail. And so a client of mine said, Walter, you should go after this. I'm like, a sculpture trail in Jackson? Why not? I drive there and this is what I saw. Black top. And you know what they wanted, a five foot sidewalk next to the curb and gutter and they would just put bad sculpture along it. And my first thing to the client was, hey guys, let's not talk about the trail. You know, let's talk about the moraine. This huge moraine out there, right? And Jim said, okay, Jim was new to the job. He let us play a little bit. And so we pretty much re-choreographed the entire visitor experience. We took the main road which used to go in front of that yellow box and pushed it up against the hill. And then we said, the sculpture terrace or overlook should run all along here, and the car should go all along the back. And that while you're experiencing this amazing moraine out front, you should not see a car, you should not have the car in relationship to you. It took us about two and a half years to get them to reduce the amount of cars. We only took about a fifth of, a fifth of the cars out, uh, but the parking lanes were for big Winnebago's and we just became more efficient, which then allowed people to do this. And so on opening day, this is what they sent us. And the trail goes, it's a quarter mile long. It's about 18 feet wide at different spaces and it breaks away and it provides a lot of different activities and places for people void of car. And so now that landscape experience of this amazing moraine where that glacier came through, people, they do 10Ks now, they sell art, and you could have that moment where that landscape just comes right up to you. And now no longer do you have to sit in a parking lot, but you can actually sit there and actually see elk bugling. During the winter, the landscape completely changes. We built new bridges, new places for people to sort of experience that crazy wildlife art. And one of the things that, again, we learned mostly about this project was that moraine is why people come there. It's not because of a park, it's not because of a trail, it's that landscape, and they couldn't see the landscape because of all this other stuff. The big SUV, the parking lot. I mean, Jackson is one of the most urban places I've ever been to. And there, there's traffic jams, people don't walk anywhere. They get in their car and go everywhere. So now, there's actually a quarter mile trail that goes downtown that will take you all the way up. And you don't even see the road anymore from the terrace. This yoga thing, they love the yoga there. Back home here in um, Oakland, California, we've been working with Hacienda Peralta, which is one of the old um, Spanish land grant pieces of land to sort of tr try to help them tell their story, which has been all over the place. Uh, they have a site in 1821 adobe that one of five brothers owned from the Peraltas. They pretty much own all the East Bay. And this is a nonprofit that has been trying to sort of figure out how to sort of pretty much manage the site. Mario Shettenham, award-winning landscape architect from Mexico, uh, created the master plan and created this design that was very sort of Baragonish, walls and things like that, and it was very um, out of scale for a lot of the people, and so we've been working with them to try to tell a different story, and a different, more humble story, because these Spanish Peraltas, the Peraltas were a humble group, and they basically had farms and cattle up in this space, 
And so they have a project called Book, a book learning project where they're collecting stories in the community. And so we're building these two small structures in order for them to tell the story. Um, and these structures are very, these very s simple lifted pieces that have walls that rotate that allow them to pretty much choreograph uh, the various events that they have. They're, they're done hacienda style where the insides are warm and, and woody and, you know, and very warm, but the outsides are very sort of hard and, and sort of edgy. We then have these spaces where the archaeology of the site is pretty much protected you know, by these structures as well. That's allowing them to maintain a lot of their sort of um, activities on site but as well as maybe tell a different story about the Peraltas, one that's not this romantic story about Spanish missions, right, but about people living in a landscape. And this landscape was very, a very harsh landscape. <coughs> Another recent is uh, Witness Walls. This is a project in Nashville, Tennessee. I was just walking through the studios with your students and it was great to see them using, looking at concrete and making concrete. We're actually, well, we sold the, the, uh, the idea that the 20th century was concrete. It's about concrete, it's not about marble. And here in Nashville, this great story about civil rights is Nashville was so good at civil rights that no one knew that they had civil rights issues. Uh, and very early in the civil rights campaign, Nashville had some of the first sit-ins in the countries and they actually went and sat in on lunch counters and the mayor, along with the civil rights activists, said, you know, you win. And I think it was like within less than a couple of months. And so Greensboro then happened next and Greensboro got all the attention. Nashville got very little attention because they pretty much integrated all of their um, lunch counters before anyone else. We applied to this RFQ because they wanted to take this derelict space and talk about the march that actually happened moving along from the department store out in front of City Hall and around the corner. And I had just sort of returned from Rome, and I had gone to this show, this Augustus show, and I was taken by these feats of strength that, you know, all of these beautiful stories about Augustus. And, you know, he went to North Africa, and, you know, he, he did everything, right? And of course, it's all fiction, just building them up to be this larger sort of emperor. And, but I love that notion of the, the heroic, the heroic, right? And could there be a way to talk about civil rights in this other way? And one of the things that we kept hearing over and over was the marching and the sitting, and that the marching and the sitting was this really powerful thing for people. And it was the youth that were doing a lot of this. And so the Witness Walls is a very simple project. It's a very meager budget. But it tries to suggest that through walking and sitting and through image, moving through space, that we can actually you know, talk about the heroics of the moment through image and through space. And so we're, we're working with trying to build three different resolutions in concrete so that from a distance you might read one thing as you get up closer, that changes, and then when you get up real close, there's a kind of a visceral reaction to the actual material itself. And as we were researching this, you know, we kept asking the question, well, this is Nashville, wasn't there any music? You know, this is Nashville, and Nashville, became the city of music, is that the name, Tim? Sorry, Music City, because this group, this African-American choir, went to England and sang for the Queen of England. And she said, you know, where are you guys from? And they said, Nashville. Oh, Music City. It's not because of, like, the cowboys, right? It's about, you know, these guys singing. And so we were inspired by that, and hopefully this will play. And this is one of the songs uh, that was recorded very early. There are sensors as you go through and the, the chorus sort of kicks in as you move around and the images come into focus and go out of focus. Then when we went down and talked to people about the project, we got into this really interesting conversation with the disc jockeys. 
And the disc jockeys of the day said, you know, well, that music is great, but you know, during the civil rights, there was this amazing rhythm and blues music played. And like Aretha Franklin respect. And I just saw a documentary on James Brown, and a lot of James Brown's early music was used during the movement. So now I think we're, we're sort of going back and forth between using you know, music of that time period that hopefully will charge those images. And the next to the last project, I'm almost finished, so I know we're running out of time, is the Cooper Hewitt Museum project here in the city. Um, the museum is opening this month. The garden will be opening next year. Um, this project is a wonderful project for us to sort of work on here in the city. It's small, but it has a very interesting sort of origin and history, and the site is just wonderful. And most of you have probably been here at the Cooper uh, Hewitt Museum, and you sort of remember the lawn. The lawn is the place that everyone sort of enters into. But under closer study, we were working with the Landscape Architecture Foundation. We found the original drawings and for the Garden of Andrew Carnegie here on Fifth Avenue. And it's a wonderful little simple design by this landscape architect, not that well known by sh name Shimmerhorn. And he created this very simple lawn and a rockery for a mansion, not for a museum, right? And so it's a very small garden. And so when we first looked at the project, the notion could we restore that lawn and rockery in a state garden and begin to sort of tie it back into the park? Because when you're along uh, Engineer's Gate here, during the winter, that landscape kind of completely disappears and you get one big landscape. When you're in the garden looking towards the park, the park becomes part of your landscape. So we started digging, and what we found was that Shimmerhorn's plan on the left wasn't actually built. That the one in the middle that was built was kind of like this kind of cockeyed, some things were made, some things weren't made, because it quickly became this institution. And we don't know if the terrace got enlarged and they just said no more with the garden. And so working with Carol, Carolyn Bowman, sort of coming back to this proposal of can we bring back the rockery and can we make this new lawn space that has this wonderful terrace that will welcome the new visitors back to the museum. And the inspirations for us is this notion, again, of borrowing things from around us. And one of the things you guys have here are good schist, good stone. I mean, every time you dig, you're gonna hit some schist. And so even here in the garden, we have schist. And so the rockery then becomes this major piece in the garden. And this context of the garden of having, again, the reservoir, Fifth Avenue, having this residential space, we think is just gonna be a wonderful sort of botanical display. You will still enter in through the gates, her, um, we're getting new signage uh, that's being done by Diller Scafidio. On the, there are new beacons on the corners. The gates will still have a lot of porosity, but the lawn will still be that kind of central figure. The vines growing up, the wisteria going up, we've been careful to make sure that that comes back as well. But then again, you'll come in through this new experience of having a cafe, an outdoor area, a rockery, and having spaces in the garden that will allow mothers to bring their kids, which happens in the morning, but a lot of events to happen on the lawn, but also visitors from the park now coming in because the park, I mean, the garden will actually be open all the time now. It won't be closed. But being able, again, to create this intimate effect, right, in bustling New York is just this, it's almost a privilege to have this, this kind of space. Uh, and, you know, every time we walk around in the garden with the, with the trustees or with Caroline, it's, it's, you know, you really feel that this is a really kind of special sort of place hemmed up in between the sort of bustling road and large scale park. And as we were working through it as well, we decided, well, are there other things that we can bring to it? Now, Olmsted did not do the planting design around the reservoir. This was all done 19th century city beautiful. So it's all of this kind of like pink stuff and stuff that's exploding, more floral. And we decided to bring some of that across the street through the cherry trees. And so during different seasons, when the cherries go up around the reservoir, you'll come across the street and they'll filter their way through as well. But this notion of, again, having more of a floral display, not rebuilding Shimmerhorn, but actually trying to understand that relationship between the estate and between now that's something that's public is the main mission of the design. 
And lastly, I want to close with a couple of pieces, um, which I think is kind of emblematic of a lot of the work. Um, and when we talk about hood design as a cultural practice, is you know being able to sort of work with again in different places, but also with different people and have a conversation with them. This is called the Jira project at Hacienda Peralta. And it's basically a project where we're asked to curate a sound piece. And again, stories were collected audibly. And we were asked if we could take this one room and create a space for people to come in and hear the stories. And so I've always wanted to make a horse. So I made a giant horse uh, using material from Andrea Valentini. There is so much pain and sometimes you know, in our darkest times, all we can do is just make a sound. All we can do is just moan. All we can do is just sing. I am sending you light to heal you, to hold you. I am sending you light to hold you in love. I can't tell you what it's like to wake up in the morning. I look at myself and I think there is nothing else that I would rather be than a black woman who sings. I feel like my job in all of those things, like when people come to my concerts, I want people to walk out of there feeling bigger in themselves than when they came in because this world shrinks the hell out of us. For young black kids, you know, there's a, there's a little, they carry around a shame about being descendants of slaves and I say, look baby, you're here. If it were not for the strength and the fortitude of our ancestors, you would not be sitting here. And I remember when, talking to my brother, Frank, who I absolutely adore, way back when we were in high school, he got really belligerent. He said, I can't believe that granddaddy calls himself a Negro, you know, or a colored man. And I said, look, if it wasn't for his colored Negro self, you would not be standing there calling yourself a black man. My grandfather was said to be very dark complected, but had long braids down his back. Seminole part of him. He was a free African who escaped upon his arrival in, into this country and went to live with the Seminole tribes. He had trouble with the Ku Klux Klan because David was said to have been a very proud man, said by most whites to be arrogant. And they say that he was a real bad actor, but they call you that in the South in those days when you uh, spoke up for yourself. Well, both of those projects, uh, the sound piece, you can actually leave a tag um, that's a baggage tag, and the horse has actually grown hair through the people who've actually come um, and left their stories. And some of these stories, people listening to these stories, they've left some of the most amazing messages. It runs from you know, a loss, grief, to something of celebration. And it's really interesting how this cross current of stories have inspired people to sort of leave their own message behind. And now we're documenting this, and these will be a book that will actually go out into the community. Thank you guys so much for your time, and enjoyed it. I, I, I am here to facilitate your asking questions. So, you know, I got eight, and if I work my way through them without somebody else standing up, I'll be very disturbed. Um, so I, I, I'm quite interested in reading some of your texts about this notion of hybridity. Um, it's, it seems uh, in your construction to lie somewhere between um, surrealist practices and botany. Um, so my, my question is, it, it, it seems that this conscious-unconscious distinction seems to suggest, on the one hand, for the unconscious, a kind of condition, uh, and for the conscious, a style of practice. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm wondering what the difference is um, and how you engage this idea of conscious hybridity in, in your own work and distinguish it from um, the more accidental variety, which still seems very powerful. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, when I spoke of um, the hybrid and particularly the conscious, it had more to do with you know, starting a practice as an academic and really trying to articulate the epistemology of you know what of the work to a certain degree, but I've always in landscape, and this is coming out of architecture because after when I was in architectural school, there was the big battle of typology, uh, the late '80s, and um, in landscape there was never any sort of critique of, you know, okay, park, let's make it, 
Screech, let's do it. And there was never this sort of critique of, well, maybe we shouldn't do these things anymore. And a lot of that came out of trying to be articulate along those lines. And slowly but surely, I started to see that me being Walter, I had other ideas that I wanted to somehow come to fruition through the work. That was very personal. Mm. Um, I mean, to, to, so. to, to carry on, obviously the idea of the, the hybrid as you first presented it um, privileges the idea of the accidental. Uh, in, a, in, in a fairly strong way. I, y your work doesn't strike me as accidental, so I, I, I wonder whether that part of the hybridity has to do with the occupation of the work, um, what other people bring to it, or whether you use this uh, as, a, as a technical medium, as a working method. Well, I think a little bit of both. I mean, all of the above. I mean, when I think of the unconscious, it actually is more freedom for me mm -hmm. to a certain degree. Um, a freedom to not have to participate within, for no better with the A&E culture of making landscapes. Mm -hmm. And I would just say that that, for me, that realization kind of freed me from that. Mm -hmm. Freed me from, um, you know, having that conversation with that tomb of work that exists out there. And, and I think a lot of it is, you know, through art practice as well, um, just being more comfortable with my own ideas and myself. And that's taken a while. And I think for any practice uh, to feel empowered that way, one has to go through a certain transformation. And for me, it had more to do with trying to be critical about the work. And the thing that is also really nice is I've been doing this for 20 years. Mm. And after 10 years to go back and look at the work is a very privileged place to be that you've made work and now you can go back and look at it and go, Wow, that's what we were thinking. I mean, while we were making the work, I was never thinking, oh, this is conscious, you know, it was sort of post. Yeah. So in a way, it's a very um, good place to be that you can step back and reflect, but it's also good that we could have the courage enough to kind of change yeah. and to kind of keep No, there's, a, there's a very interesting dialogue in your work between a kind of formality and a kind of weirdness. So in the, in the BART project, for example, I mean, the scale jumps and the, the eccentric overuse of certain <laughs> items, that's, that speaks to one thing, which is quite different from the, what you did at the Cooper Hewitt, for, yeah. for, for yeah. example. Um, so, you, you, you brought up your experience in school, um, and, and certainly any, any observer of the landscape profession of late, particularly in its academic incarnation, sees an incredible jostling. You know, from my perspective, teaching urbanism, yeah. um, you know, the, the insistence on, of landscape architects increasingly through, you know, what I made a little list here, um, you know, uh, landscape urbanism, ecological urbanism, agricultural urbanism, green urbanism, that, that somehow um, you are the appropriate hegemons uh, of the urban um, is um, strange and a little bit disturbing. Why, why, why is this happening? And do, I don't know. Do, I didn't do, mention any of those terms tonight, yeah. did I? <laughs> I don't think I mentioned any of those, right? That there was no landscape I'm, urbanism, I'm not, right? I'm not, I'm, not, I? I'm not accusing. I'm, I'm just accusing. making sure. Um, I'm, I'm, no, but, but I'm looking for a wise and objective voice. I don't know why people. Academy. What's going on? I think it's easy. Yeah. I mean, you know, landscape goes through this. I think it's easy to come up. Oh, creek restoration. You know, uh, community gardens. You know, and to find this one thing that will solve all problems. Right? Landscape urbanism. You know, now infrastructure. Come on, you know, landscape architects were always about infrastructure. You know, I learned how to like grade a road in undergraduate school. I learned how to do sanitary sewer. I mean, we were always about infrastructure, always about the horizon. It's just a lot of people gave it up or just not good at it. Uh, but those things don't interest me because they take away from other things. They take away from seeing real places. Mm. You know what I mean? That, that these projects come in, they take away from seeing Opalaka, seeing these people walk two and a half miles in the heat. You know, because I walk two and a half miles in the heat. You know, and that's not a landscape urbanist sort of move. And so I just think a lot of it gets in the way for us really being in those places. And I've had a lot of people over, over the years tell me that they can't work in certain places anymore. Right? Because that's the way they look, maybe, yeah. or whatever. I just think this sort of notion that, you know, the ability to go and work in a place and see it for what it is and have an idea 
And so if there's enough of those ideas that we can have, we can be critical with one another, it's kind of non-existing in the landscape to a certain degree. I find it more, uh, the conversation existing more in art practice, particularly in social art practices. Yeah, we, we, we certainly share an anxiety about the so-called environment, uh, and, and neither of us seems to be able to come up with a practice that's um, you know, ad adequate to the task yeah. of, of, of a genuine crisis. Um, so, yeah, actually, that, that's a that's a follow-on question. I mean, is, is given the 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 actual scale, uh, the actual magnitude of the shit we're in, um, what what do you, what do you what what do you see as a kind of path of um, reform for uh, our respective professions? I mean, what 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 can we do that that's somehow commensurate with the scale of the problem? Well, I, mean, I think well, I, I think if you again, if you Look at where you are. Here in Manhattan, you know, it's interesting um, to have this conversation with friends a lot. I don't recall, and it's because I don't live here in Manhattan, but I don't recall until post 11 that people started referring to it as an island. Mm. Right, until certain, you know, all of a sudden it's, it's an island. It's gosh, you can't get off it, you know? I mean, but this notion that if we start thinking about where we live, I mean, I live next to a bay, what does that mean? Or these guys in Wyoming, you know, they, they live in this amazing um, landscape, but it's the Snake River. Mm. That's the Snake River moving through this thing, and it has moved all over the place. Or, you know, Florida, you know, it's like to build a building in Florida, you gotta dig a big hole, take the limestone out, and use it for ballast. So that's why they got big holes everywhere in Florida and if you start noticing this thing it's a quite wonderful conversation to have yeah. right about landscape so it's not always about uh, being the uh, how can I say what's the term landscape architecture being the protector or being that person who you know is there at the gate mm -hmm. you know you can't cut the tree down you can't do this but really thinking about those places that sometimes they might want to die and be reborn through another sort of well the, sort of the, I mean speaking of island certainly our anxiety about being a, on an island has been increased <laughs> in post Sandy um, so uh, the, the last question I was going to ask you which I'm now asking out of sequence is is um, you know if you were the hegemon of Manhattan or New York City, um, what, what, what course would you advise us to take other than uh, as relates to sea level change? That's a good question, Michael. Um, I would say, I think I would say to keep building the city through the lens of the culture of the people who live here. So if the people who live here want to build giant storm walls, we're going to build them. Mm. But I'm just saying it's, it's got to come out of place for it to be sort of cultivated. And you know, there, there are wonderful places that I've been where cultures of people said, we're going to try to fight it out. And there are amazing places where people said, we want to live this other way. We want to live horizontal. I want to live in the water. I want to live in the muck. But you got to want to live in the muck. You know, you can't just talk about living in the muck. When I say muck, I mean, you can't just talk about living in wetlands. You know, you see these beautiful pictures, wetlands everywhere. Wetlands are awful. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're working in Charleston, South Carolina now. I mean, right now the wetlands are disappearing because people want to live in South Carolina. They didn't want to live there like 20 years ago. They want to live there now, so they're draining the wetlands. So again, if we're, if we're true, there are cultures who live in places where, you know, there's this reciprocation. And, but I think in the most American cities, I, I think we talk about the reciprocation, but it's a really hard thing to do because that means we're going to have to give something up. Okay. So, right? so just following on this, and, and please come, come up to these microphones and ask your questions. Um, now, pl place, um, I, I imagine is a, a, a social construction, mm -hmm. yeah? Um, and one of the things we've learned in, in terms of thinking about public space and public place is um, that there's not a uniform public, um, that in fact in our work we deal with a multiplicity of publics. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you straight out, since, since some of your projects um, reference this, is, is there um, a landscape architecture or a style of placemaking that, that you think is particular to African Americans? I think there are um, spaces and places and environments that are particular to different cultural settings and groups. And if that happens to move across race, I would say yes. Um, we were having this discussion in my class. I teach a class on difference and diversity. And, you know, this notion of 
when you put certain people, you give them a certain backdrop, right? We then look at them in a completely different way, right? And we've chosen in a lot of cases in this country to give certain people the worst backdrop imaginable. <laughs> and those people then have had to cultivate a way to live with that backdrop. Right? And you can say that's different, you can say it's bad or whatever, but once you start to understand that, then you can actually change some of the sociology of spaces, you know, through thinking about that backdrop. At Lafayette Square Park, we spent $2.1 million on an acre and a half of space that no one wanted to spend. This was like 1995, and it was for transient guys who came there to drink beer and play checkers. And those guys look good. Right, I mean, two and a half million dollars, and you go, and those guys did not look scary. You know, same guys. They got a big green hill, they got a bathroom, they got a shelter, really cool. I mean, they, and people would go up and start talking. But you give that same guys $5 a square foot landscape, no one's gonna go in that landscape because those guys are gonna look either scary, they're gonna look, down and out, you know, I mean, so the back, it really does matter. And I think that's why the Powell Street project, again, you know, that million dollars on the threshold, the tenderloin, you see some of the tenderloin guys sitting on Powell Street now. Mm. And you don't go, wow, they look like everybody else. Mm. And so I do think, you know, we can talk about difference and making people sort of, um, how can I say, making that difference recognizable. But the thing that I'm more interested in is, really trying to understand the context and the cultural patterns and practices and trying to help have that conversation about how, how should that manifest itself. Mm. And I don't think there's a, well, let me, a let or me, this or that. Let me ask you a, a provocative question and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna finish up because you, know, you, you, you should get your word in or we should all go drinking. Um, so I, I was looking at um, images today of um, Canfield Street in Ferguson, Missouri, um, which is a horrible street, and you know a horrible murder was enacted there. Um, but it, it's um, it's it, it's a generic horrible street of a certain sort. I, I wonder if you were asked, and you know I was very moved by the Obalaka struggle. Uh, good luck, good luck with those people. Um, if if you were called upon to do something about Canfield Street, how would you begin? I'd have to go to Ferguson first. Mm. Um, no, but we were having this discussion about walking in the middle of the street, right? Blacks walk in the middle of the road, right? It's like my neighborhood, you're driving down the street, there's always someone in the middle of the road. But I would also say there are other cultural groups that walk in the middle of the road as well. But you have to understand why they're walking in the middle of the road. I would say in a lot of marginal neighborhoods, when I say marginal, there's not a lot of investment. That edge, you don't want to be on that edge because the edge is awful. Houses are burned out, you know, it's just stuff. And so the street is actually the better path. Mm -hmm. And so that might be a beginning of having a conversation about what is, you know, what is the predilection of that landscape, that those edges. And again, when I lived in various neighborhoods, and even where I live now, Tim probably does it when he walks to the corner store. You probably don't use the sidewalks. But, but there's something, there's just no investment on the edges. You know, and it creates a different set of social patterns that are unrecognizable to other people mm -hmm. who have great crap on their sidewalks mm -hmm. who are like, well, why are these people walking in the middle of the street? Right, and it's like there must be something going on. There's nothing going on other than I got this huge right of way and there's all this stuff over here and stuff over here. And so, I mean, I think it starts with trying to understand, again, the sociology of those spaces and why do people sort of act in a certain way. Yeah, I mean, I, yes, a, a very interesting observation and somebody must start writing about walking in the middle of the street, which, you know, which, which, which is very much unpackable. I mean, you know, not, not only in terms of the scariness of the edge, uh, but in terms of a sense of proprietorship Power, yep. of the public space that's yep. available to you, but also in terms of the, you know, the, the most current traffic planning theory of our <laughs> beloved Dutch friends, uh, you know, in, in which the idea of the shared street is, is you know, is coming to be a, a, an important thing. Um, so I, let, me, let me open this to y'all. Harry. Harry. Oh my um, God. 
Father, I have a question that uh, relates to some of the things you were just saying, but it's provoked by the project in Philadelphia, the Alley Project, which I found really fascinating. Uh, my question is about process and about the role of the designer as a provocateur mm -hmm. to process. When you were talking about getting this project going in the community, first of all, it struck me it's very labor intensive for you. Uh, and somewhat like, I'm old enough so I can remember my father trying to start the Model T. <laughs> you crank it, you crank it, you crank it, and finally something happens. My question to you is because it seems to me that when you talk about this kind of community involvement and very, very local involvement, of course what's fascinating is that the look, the nature of that, it, I don't know how you found an alley that has such an amazing array of problems along it, but <laughs> I guess that's the city. Yeah. Uh, uh, you've now got it to a point where the crank has taken hold, the engine is going. So we hope, we hope, yes. Yeah. And at a certain point, do you, do you see yourself as having started something from which you, which you then leave uh, yeah. and you become the observer, if you will, yeah. or maybe you never go back, or maybe you right. wait till you're invited back, or what happens? Because this is clearly, you're talking about an episodic mm -hmm. thing, about something that, and, and those episodes are fascinating, uh, but ultimately the transformation to become real and right. enduring has to be something that they take possession of right. right there. Is that happening? Yes, I mean, our role for this project, and again, these public art projects or the role of working as a, a social practitioner or an artist in the communities, there's very little monetary, right, uh, investment, one, in the practice. But I understand also that we are there to serve as provocateur to get people to hopefully see something within that space. And at the end of the day for us, you know, they have a grant now for a little over $100,000. I just want them to repave the road for two blocks and create a nice ground plane. Because the act, there's enough activity there now that's beginning to happen for a lot of these pieces to take on their own life. And, and yeah, and if I don't go back to Philly, I think that would be okay to that alley and work. But yeah, just starting that process because our critique was that they were just making a lot of pop-up projects, you know, through these social art practices. You know, one weekend they'd, they'd have a, some artist doing a community sound box or, and they never talked about the entirety and the community. And I think for us, it was our role to talk about these larger things, make a few projects that might push, and then step back and see how they might evolve without being dictatorial or without even being critical to a certain degree. And the big point was the alley's the alley. It's 17 feet wide and, you know, don't make it into something that's 100 feet wide because it's still 17 feet. So. Going once? Yes. I just thought you were going to say twice. And I'm a practicing landscape architect here in New York City. Hey man, how you doing? <laughs> and, uh, we're happy you're here. We're happy you're doing work locally. Great. Um, it's an interesting flux for this profession right now, and I have questions for you about that. Uh, you've been practicing for a while. You've been in academics, and then you're, you have your practice. Um, I see oftentimes that we can be catalysts, and you use that word, and I think that's a terrific spot to be. However, it seems historically we've been catalysts to a point and then fallow. And my question is, do you see this profession actually having a larger expansive role than has been true for the last 
40 years or so. Um, it's disappointing. I will say one of the disappointing things, and it's not a big uh, criticism, but here at the AIA, there are no ASLA CEU credits, which I find interesting. Bring us in, please, too. We are part here. Um, but if you wouldn't mention that, and not to create any disturbance, but I believe in many ways the landscape urbanism is about some way of making this a bigger profession than rather the Small. confluence of garden design. Yep. I don't, there are questions in there. I hope you find some of them. Yep. Well, the one thing I think we, we have to forget, though, and I think I mentioned it, you know, landscape architecture or the environmental design profession at one point in time did talk about, right? I mean, multidisciplinary design, right? I mean, where people, landscape architects, architects, planners, work together. You know, schools were actually created around this idea. I mean, I teach at one. It's called the College of Environmental Design. They have planning, architecture, landscape, all under one roof. Landscape used to be over in plant science, you know, and bringing all of these things in. And that's the end of the 60s, early of the 70s. Now, whether that experiment or those relationships have led to any, have led to fruition about that dynamic, I mean, I would take the side that it hasn't. You know, I mean, I teach in a college where it's actually worse today than it was when I started teaching 20 years ago. That everybody's in their silos doing their own things. Architects, of course, are doing landscape. They don't know what the hell they're doing. But, but they're doing landscape, you know, the projects are landscape-based projects. No interface with the department. No, and, you know, I mean, so it's not a real, you know, set of, um, it's not a real conversation to a certain degree. It's a set of appropriations here and there. I mean, I thought it was a great thing to teach in a school that had that. I teach first-year architecture. It's one of my best courses I like teaching. It's great to have that, you know, an other conversations about ways of doing it. And I do think the schools are still there, and I still think we have the infrastructure to do it. We just need the individuals who want to do it. Uh, and I think there are, the, I think the younger group of people coming up today, I'm hoping, I'm very optimistic uh, that a lot of people are coming through our joint programs that are getting multiple degrees, that are actually experiencing both sides of the culture. Hopefully that's a growing trend, but, um, you know, I don't need to sort of talk about the kind of the hierarchical relationships that's set up in A&E practices. Um, and, you know, we choose, you know, to work with people who are, yeah, who are gracious, you know, with their times and their ideas, who want to have a conversation. And there are some great architects, great landscape architects, who want to have those conversations here. And um, I think, you know, I'm optimistic. I'm still practicing, so I'm optimistic. So, on behalf of the League, um, let me thank you for the beauty of your work and the inspiration of your practice. Um, thank you.